Welcome to the Navit Gaming Podcast, where it is our mission to explore the business and future of video games. We bring together the industry's brightest builders, investors, and thinkers to keep a pulse on current events, dissect emerging trends and games, share lessons learned, and have a great time. This podcast is also part of Novik's growing ecosystem, which ranges from free and premium research to consulting and advisory services. For more information, visit www.novik.co. This episode is brought to you by Grid, the preferred live data platform of game publishers, including Riot Games, Crafton, and Ubisoft, along with over 70 CSGO and Dota 2 tournament organizers. Grid supports them all with data infrastructure and distribution solutions to drive innovation, unlock new revenue streams, and empower both the community and professional players. Whether you're developing an indie RTS with modding potential, a new FPS with esports ambitions, or are responsible for an established game at a large studio, Grid can provide you with the -the off-the-shelf title agnostic Grid SDK or a fully customizable solution to unlock the potential of data for games of any size. And if you're a fan, developer, or entrepreneur with an idea for a live data-powered project, make sure to apply for Grid Open Access, get free access to official data, and start creating today. If that sounds compelling, you can learn more and sign up at grid.gg. And with that, let's jump into the episode. Hi, everyone. I'm your host, Aaron Bush. And today I am delighted to be joined by David Taylor. David has been a product manager at companies like EA and Super Social. But what you really need to know is that he is on top of UGC gaming as much as anyone in the industry. If you read Navic Digest or our Deep Dives, for example, you've almost definitely read David's great content regarding the latest on Roblox, UEFN, or other platforms. David also recently spearheaded Novik's State of UGC Gaming in 2024 report, which, if you are to read any single piece of content this year on UGC and games, this is it. So I'll link that one to the show notes so you can check out if you haven't already. Um, But really, I'm very excited to to have David on the podcast today. He's also a consultant at Novik and works with teams all around the industry. to help them better succeed in the realm of UGC games. I've learned a lot from him, and I think you'll learn a lot from him today as well. So with that, David, welcome to the Novik Gaming Podcast. Thanks for having me, Aaron. Well, David, we have a bunch of topics to get into today. We're going to dig fairly deep into the current and future states of Roblox, UEFN, and other platforms, mainly from a developer perspective. But Before we dig in, I was just curious, um, kind of a question about you. What about UGC Gaming made you decide to go all in on it? What's your story and how you got into this? Yeah. um, Interestingly, my origin story for UGC Gaming is also a little bit of a Novik origin story as well. Um, So it all started, I was doing a strategy project at EA around Web3 and the metaverse. And was obviously listening to a lot of Crypto Corner. Um, And uh, in my research, I just sort of stumbled upon Roblox. And, you know, I had been looking at Decentraland and the Sandbox as, you know, these these, um, Web3 platforms. And, and, uh, you know, I I went to my boss and I said, hey, you know, Sandbox and Decentraland have like a thousand DAU. And then over here, we have Roblox, which has 50 million DAU. <laughs> and uh, should we maybe do something with Roblox? Because, you know, they kind of check the same boxes of being able to sell your your cosmetic items, being able to take them across experiences. Um, and uh, my boss was basically like, well, Roblox is sort of a competitor. I don't think we'd want to like partner with them on anything. Um, and so I started just sort of doing my own independent research. And I think my first article for Novik was around a license, like um, was around Sonic Speed Simulator and like legacy IP that was being licensed on Roblox and being successful, like Hello Kitty as well. Um, and it was through that that I sort of discovered that a bunch of these studios had raised venture funding, and uh, I was sort of perplexing to me because obviously the, the the TAM for a Roblox developer is is pretty capped by the platform itself. Uh, and so I wanted to do a little bit more research on that. 
And then I wrote that article, Roblox Developer Unit Economics, just breaking down like how to be successful on the platform or, or what it takes to be successful on the platform. And that got a lot of traction. A lot of people reached out to me interested to learn more. And I think that sort of, that article is really what, you know, got me into UGC. A couple of things were one, there's a ton of data available. Uh, you know, these, these platforms are building in public because they're, they're, you know, they're doing it for players, but they're also doing it for creators. And so you get to see in real time, like what are the features that they're working on because the developers, the creators, you know, it's kind of synonymous in this world. Um, you know, they, they need to know what's coming down the pipe. So it was, you know, a function of there's just a ton of information available to do analysis on. And then the other thing is both, you know, Roblox and Fortnite, who we'll talk about, I think later, probably, uh, they publish the uh, active user bases, the concurrent players of each of the experiences. So you can actually do analysis on the games themselves. So just the wealth of information that was available uh, was really, really compelling. And then the fact that not a lot of people were writing about this meant that like people were reaching out to me and really interested to learn more, which is obviously extremely motivating. Yeah, you definitely opened a lot of people's eyes onto, I think, the scale and just the unique, the unique way that things are done in these platforms that, um, you know, many professionals around the industry, they kind of know of, but they don't really know. Um, and so um, even, you know, you continue to do that. So for, for those wanting to know more, sign up to, to Novic Digest and we'll, we'll discuss more ways to follow David later. Um, but one, one more question before we dive into the weeds on, on Roblox first. Um, so you've been paying attention to the UGC gaming world for a couple of years uh, in depth, I would say now. Um, is there anything over that time that you have changed your mind on in a big way? Yeah. So, I mean, just at the beginning, I was skeptical, right? As I mentioned, just the, the total addressable market being capped by you know the platform themselves. And I think I haven't changed my mind about that. Uh, they are, they're definitely capped. It's, it's hard to be uh, profitable as a Roblox studio. Um, it's just extremely competitive. But I think the thing that I, that has really opened my eyes is just like the talent that are building on these platforms. Um, just to give an example, like at Super Social, we had uh, one of our like senior engineers was 19 years old and he had been developing since he was seven. And so you know, I'm working with this this you know kid for all intents and purposes, who had more who had 12 years of work experience, which is more work experience than I have. Uh, and so, you know, can you think about that and how a lot of these kids are learning these technical skills and also not just learning technical skills, but uh, game design, marketing, community management, all the things that are critical to game development today. Uh, you, you know extrapolate 10 years from now, these are going to be sort of the, the superstars of the game industry. And you see that already manifesting today with, you know, Zekers, you know, making $50 million in a matter of months off of Lethal Company. And I just think that, uh, you know, that's not going to be the last time we see that. And in fact, I expect to see that a lot more in the coming years. Nice. Well, let's go ahead and jump into Roblox. We'll hit on UFN and some other platforms um, later. But of course, in our industry, there really is no shortage of discussion about Roblox. But even so, I feel like many people are still sleeping on both the current relative scale of the platform, but perhaps especially the future trajectory of how big Roblox can eventually become from an active user and monetization perspective. Um, so before we, we kind of dive into what's working or not on Roblox and what's next, could you maybe start just by framing up some numbers around Roblox's scale for everyone before we dive in? Yeah, I, I wrote some numbers down here. We got 350 million MAUs. Uh, you know, that's an estimate, but you know, 300 to 350 million MAUs is a realistic number. Which, um, so, which I'll just quickly add to, I think like PlayStation is like 120, 130, something like that. So, and yeah. Xbox is even smaller. So that's larger than both of the largest 
console platforms combined. But anyways, continue. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so seventy million DAU, and then you know ten million concurrence at at you know peak times, and so you know as you mentioned, bigger than PlayStation and Xbox combined. Also, from a concurrent player's perspective, it's the same size as Steam, um, and so this is obviously one of the largest, you know, close to the largest gaming platforms in the world, and uh, and then. You know, in terms of revenue, it's obviously a lot smaller, you know, $3.3 billion in bookings. Compare that to Xbox, which I think reported $16.3 billion in bookings. Um, but interestingly, if you look at their sort of reported numbers for Xbox Game Pass, I think that last time I saw was $3.6 billion. So, as, you know, when you think about a content platform, Xbox Game Pass and Roblox are sort of you know, on parity in terms of revenue generating uh, platforms. So, you know, obviously as a free to play platform, it's not, uh, it's not going to be monetizing on a player basis as highly as, as console, but still a, a, a large amount of money going into be, to, to Roblox. Right. Well, let me um, lead in to start talking about the content side of this now. And this is sort of a loaded question, but what are a few underrated elements or patterns of the most successful Roblox games today? At the platform level, the most underrated element is just the seamless ability to go from experience to experience. So like in a single play session, a Roblox player will play eight different games, uh, which I think is a, a different play pattern than what you see in other on other platforms where players really sink into one or two, you know, maybe three games at a time. But on Roblox, it's not the case. They are just sort of, you know, they're migratory players. They go from one place to the next. And, you know, as a result, you see retention is a lot lower. Um, and I think because of that transient element to, to players, you see a lot of explicit effort to retain them with really big offers to, you know, come back on a daily basis and get a really big reward. Um, so you know, one of the things that you'll see in Roblox experiences is just a lot of incentives to get people to play for long periods of time, come back on a daily basis, and help these, you know, developers hit their metrics that helps them get into the the discovery algorithm for Roblox. Is there anything on like the monetization side or the social side or, you know, what, what actually is being built that you've noticed is any type of pattern that's been more successful over the past year or so? Yeah, I mean, community is obviously a huge part of it. I don't think that's that different from from other uh, platforms, but the ability to, you know, publish a game and show it to tens of thousands of your, your followers makes a really big difference in terms of getting the attention of the Roblox algorithm. Essentially, everything comes down to getting the attention of the Roblox algorithm. If you If yeah. you don't do that, then there's no... There's no other way to succeed. So basically, it's all about getting the attention of the algorithm, making sure that your metrics hit uh, hit the metrics of your other competitors that the algorithm deems you to have. Um, and so, you know, from an uh, from a audience perspective, having an existing community really helps. Um, the other the other lever is uh, is leveraging influencers who are representative or have a similar audience to what you're trying to target because, you know, on the Roblox platform, there's no guarantee that your game's going to get put in front of your, your target audience. You know, hopefully the algorithm eventually susses that out. But if you really want to make it explicit, you have to sort of find other means in order to get players in the game who represent your target audience and then train the algorithm to, uh, to favor those players. Right. That makes sense. Um, and obviously, it's changing all the time, and we can't necessarily predict how the algorithm <laughs> will will change, you know, month to month or over the long term. But I am curious um, how how do you think the meta of what makes a standout Roblox game? Uh, how do you think that will evolve over the next few years? Or you know, what like a standout game to get noticed by the algorithm? Like, like, how is yeah. that going to evolve over the next few years? Any, like, big ideas on that? Yeah, so, I mean, I think I, you know, just to cover the existing state, just to kind of summarize, it's community, you know, 
having a Discord community that you can publish to uh, partnerships, so influencers, but also you know having other Roblox games that you can maybe put a portal in to start to final players to your experience. Um, and then just from a, like a game design perspective, there's a lot of fast following where it's like you look at what's been successful and then you do something similar, but with some sort of innovation that sort of pushes it past the existing successful game. Um, and so, you know, I don't see that changing anytime soon, but I think the ways in which you achieve that might change. So like, you know, with AI tools coming to Roblox, you might see developers able to develop experiences faster. And so like speed to market becomes more of an advantage um, because, you know, you get faster tools, you know, it's all about, can you get, can you get uh, your game published and get people into the, to the game? Because there's a lot of um, sort of a path dependency to the Roblox algorithm, which is like, if you already have players in your experience, then the algorithm is more likely to recommend more players to your experience. And so it's really, there is an advantage to being sort of first to market. Um, and so speed is going to be a, a big factor. Um, I think the other thing is just as the world, you know, gets the next generation of iPhone or Android phone, that's going to enable more high fidelity experiences to be played globally today. You know, there is a sacrifice that you make if you use high fidelity graphics, which is that it impacts performance on lower end devices. And so you're basically carving out a part of the market that you can't access for your audience. So as that as that changes, you know, there's more flexibility for developers to use those those um, animations and and graphics that might you know increase their memory usage. Um, and then lastly, I would say, um, you know, if on the community side, like if there are new platforms that emerge, like you know, TikTok has become a huge source of acquisition. Blade Ball exploded off of the back of TikTok videos. Um, if there are new platforms and emerge, then just being able to establish an audience on those platforms is, is a critical part as well. Right. That makes a lot of sense. And obviously, you know, even beyond that, Roblox is trying to expand its audience in various ways on new platforms. It's trying to, to age up and retain um, players for longer. It's expanding into new geographies. It's doing all of this at the same time. Um, and each of those kind of has its own implications and considerations for how the platform might change or what might work on the platform over time. Um, and maybe just to hit on the, the, the international piece first, I'm curious to hear how you think Roblox games, how well they translate internationally. And, you know, you know, just for context, when Netflix, you know, kind of a different industry, but still entertainment, when they initially aim to expand internationally, um, the company believed that content made everywhere would translate well to other regions. And while that did happen in some notable cases, right, like Squid Games as like the peak example, um, in most cases, it actually hasn't translated at all. And they've learned that in order to succeed in different countries, they have to create, you know, more region specific content for for those people. Um, obviously, in the games industry, the content gets localized all the time, but also has, you know, a bunch of regional implications where fandoms are bigger in some places or different types of games and mechanics are popular in specific regions. How do you think this is this is and is going to play out on on Roblox? Do you think it'll be sort of Netflix like in that way? Or do you think these game experiences actually do translate around the world um, better? Than, than others might expect. Yeah, I mean, just anecdotally, like from the, the games I've worked on, like you see that different games will have different audience uh, geographic, you know, uh, breakdowns. So, you know, clearly there's different things that resonate better with, with different audiences. Um, you know, Roblox has localization uh, features as well, which essentially are, are supposed to make you able to publish once and then it be, you know, consumable uh, across the world. Right. Another thing about Roblox games is you really don't want to use a lot of words. Um, you know, Roblox players don't like to, to read through your paragraph <laughs> tutorial. They want to just sort of play it and figure it out for themselves, or at least for it to be just intuitive with a lot of like icons and, 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 um, 
And so, you know, maybe that's a function of the localization features not being as strong or just that these are younger players and, and younger players aren't really interested in, in reading a lot. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, international is, is key to, to Roblox's growth. Uh, you've seen, you know, one, one sort of data point from a few years ago is that 70% of, of um, kids between the ages of 9 and 12 in the U.S., play Roblox. So if you think about that, that's like, okay, the US is getting pretty saturated, right? And so how does Roblox continue to grow? Uh, and expanding into international markets is a big part of that. They've seen, they've been successful for the most part. They've gotten 47% uh, CAGR on DAUs from international markets over the last four years, or five years, actually. And I mean, it hasn't all been successful. They had a big push into China that sort of failed. They they tried to, to push into China within a year. They pulled out. Um, but I think for the most part, they're finding uh, success, and you can see that reflected in their sort of twenty percent year over year growth on the platform. That has been pretty consistent over the last few years. Um, you know, Japan is a big target for them. They they grew bookings there one hundred seventy four percent. So. You know, when you look at, at that kind of growth, I think, you know, whether it's that there are creators in those markets who are building the experiences that are, you know, facilitating the growth or whether these aren't, they're not, they're not local creators, but the localization features are enabling for that type of growth. Like the thing about the thing that I think is different about Roblox versus Netflix is like Roblox only pays if you're successful, you know, right. they don't pay for all the experiences that don't make it. Um, whereas Netflix oftentimes has to pay for content to uh, be produced and then put on their platform. And so, you know, Roblox, I think, you know, at the end of the day is agnostic as to whether they need those local creators to be successful or if as long as the numbers are going up, like either way, it's fine. That's fair. Um, and then second, uh, I just wanted to get your take on the whole aging up argument and whether you... Uh, whether you kind of buy it, the narrative that Roblox is pushing forward. Like Roblox has been saying that the the young adult segment is, you know, fast growing. I think they're fastest growing segment. Uh, but, you know, they attach growth rates, but they don't really attach the base <laughs> number. So, you know, how how big of a percentage it really is of of their their business. Um, so I'm curious in your research and and work on the platform, have you become more or less concerned about players graduating Roblox um, and moving on? Or do you think they actually have done a pretty good job of keeping players on longer than they would have in the past? Yeah, these are, this is one of those things that Roblox sort of tiptoes around, which also makes me suspicious a little bit. Uh, but, you know, if there is reason to be skeptical, it's not because the data doesn't say that they are aging up. The, the data definitely says that. I think, you know, I can't remember what the percentage was, but it's like 20% of players are over the age of 25. And then between 18 and 25, it's like another 15%, something in that range. And right. so from a data perspective, it's saying that, that they're aging up. But the problem is, is that how many of those accounts are kids who are having their parents create accounts so they can access more mature content. Oh. And I think that is sort of the, the question mark that's in everyone's heads. Like, you know, when we would look at our data and it would say, you know, 18 plus is your biggest audience. We were like, okay, but this was a game made for like 12 year old kids. So is it really our biggest audience? <laughs> um, and, and I think that, I think if there's reason to be skeptical, it's just that, you know, Roblox doesn't have a way to truly track how old their players are. And as such, you know, they may not be aging up as much as, as they say they are. Yeah. How do you view that longer term, though? Because obviously, you know, Roblox is always working on a bunch of things to enable more types of games to be made that could, you know, serve, you know, an adult audience better than they've done in the past. Do you think they'll figure that out? And this aging up argument, you know, will work to some degree. It doesn't mean that people won't play other games elsewhere. Of course they will. Um, but uh, yeah, in, in terms of kind of looking at longer term, where do you sit kind of on your bullishness versus bearishness on the aging up argument? I, I think that there's, I mean, I sort of mentioned, you know, as devices get 
get more powerful. There's more opportunity to create those types of experiences that are targeted to older audiences, like front lines, for example. Like like front lines, everyone talks about is like you know you know the Call of Duty of Roblox. Um, at the end of the day, it only you know has between two thousand and three thousand concurrent users, which is is a good experience for Roblox perspective, but it's not like anything to be to write home about. Like that game's probably only making you know a fifty thousand to a hundred thousand uh, dollars, maybe maybe more than that, more, probably more like two hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, so it's like that; those types of experiences are not the ones that have really like broken through. But I could see that changing in the future. Um, and I think that the thing that makes me really bullish about Roblox is just the social graph. Like the, everyone's grew, like at this point, everyone's grown up on Roblox. And so if all of your friends are on Roblox, as long as there's things that can keep you engaged, like it's a pretty, there's, it's really hard to leave because then you need to bring all of your friends with you to play like a specific game. And, and if you grew up on Roblox, you also are not, you know, you're used to a frictionless game switching experience, which other platforms are not able to provide today. So there's a lot of reasons to stay on Roblox if there's content for you to play as you age up. And I think the fact that, you know, you know, there's going to be more powerful devices enabling more high fidelity games. And the fact that all of these players are already on Roblox, you know, logically speaking, I think that they, they could definitely do it. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. I mean, I personally lean bullish long term on a lot of these yeah. these debates uh, you, you can see the snowball you know gradually growing and expanding <laughs> it's a big you know. snowball already it really <laughs> it's is growing at 20 percent a year so <laughs> basically doubling is, every three years it's still rolling down the mountain um yeah. well uh, kind of switching switching gears within roblox one of the most interesting new economic developments on the platform is advertising, especially immersive ads, which you recently wrote about in Novic Digest. Um, for those who haven't read your piece, how do you think this feature will will play out in the near term and and the long term? Like, how how transformative really is this for for Roblox? Well, I think the opportunity is huge, right? Uh, on the mobile game side, I think mean, you know Eric Sufert, uh, Data AI, they've they've estimated about 50% of mobile games revenue comes from advertising. So if you think about that being translated to Roblox, which is 78% mobile, you can imagine a world where there are $3.3 billion in bookings that they have today, you know, becomes $6.6 billion in bookings when you add advertising on top of it. So personally, I think that there's a lot of opportunity there. But to date, I feel like there's not been a path put forward for advertisers to really see the ROI um, that they that they need to 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 scale that advertising uh, that that demand, which ultimately is what's required. So, you know, I can go into details on, to, on sort of some of the challenges at this point. I think ro what what Roblox is finding is they're sort of they've got they want to. They, they don't want to favor brand experiences. They want to, to be sort of a organic and non-preferential ecosystem where the best games, you know, bubble to the top. And that's what players are exposed to. And the problem that brands are having is that, you know, a Roblox player sees a brand. They know what that is. It's an advertisement, right? And so there's already an inclination to avoid it. And to not engage with it, even if even if a brand does make a legitimately compelling and engaging experience, at the end of the day, the Roblox player is thinking, "This is an advertisement. Uh, I'm going to get out of here as soon as I get my reward." <laughs> right. And uh, and so that's what what uh, brands are finding is that you know they spend all this money trying to create an experience that keeps players engaged, and then it's all free marketing for them, or in some cases, they can make money. Um, but that's not played out in reality. What happens is they spend all that money, make a super, you know, high fidelity experience, really compelling gameplay. Because, you know, there's some serious talent at these studios. But at the end of the day, it's got a big brand on it that says like, that says to players like, don't play me. <laughs> and uh, and that's hard to to get around. So, 
you know, what I lay out in the article is basically they need to change their approach. It needs to stop being sort of like, a oh, we can create a persistent experience that will engage players forever and we only have to pay for it once and start thinking about it as like more traditional mobile games advertising where you create a smaller experience that's, you know, a short, a short, punchy gameplay experience that players don't have to learn. They immediately know how to play it and they do it for like 30 seconds to, you know, a few minutes. And then they get out of it. And I think if you see, if you were to do that, the, the cost for brands would go down and, and advertising on Roblox would become a lot more compelling opportunity. And, and then overall, the total market would just grow from there. Yeah, I was going to, was going to ask about the impact that, that ads like new ad formats on Roblox would have on branded worlds because it makes sense why branded worlds became a thing on Roblox. It was, you know, like the main way for any company to try to to get in front of of users when there weren't other options. But if there do become other options, do you think that basically means that these companies are just going to shift gears and mainly go more all in on advertising and other forms or do you think that's going to build on top of branded worlds and we'll see a lot more of both in the future yeah i mean it's hard it like i think there's a lot of just copycat sort of activity in in roblox not just on the developer side but also on the brand side it's like you know today brands look at other brand experiences and they're like oh i want to do that for my brand but i think you know, as, as, you know, pocket marketing sort of marketing budgets tighten up, you start to need to show that ROI. And that's where I think it shifts to other opportunities where branded experience is more of a novelty. If you really are trying to drive ROI, then there's other marketing levers that you can pull, you know, in one in particular that I would, you know, say is if you can activate on an existing experience that already has an established audience that is a lot more uh likely to drive traffic to your you know your brand outside of roblox which ultimately i think is what you know everyone wants is to increase sales of their whatever their products are um and so like it's a lot less work for the developers just to add some you know gameplay mechanic or gameplay component that has a brand element to it than it is to create an entirely new game from scratch, try and beat the Roblox algorithm, like funnel to the top for organic discovery. Like, that is just such a long and treacherous, never proven <laughs> uh, journey versus if you go to a, an experience like Livetopia and you put your brand in it, you're going to be guaranteed a certain amount of traffic. It might, it'll probably still be expensive because, you know, Lytopia knows what they have on their hands and they know what they can charge, but you're, you're more likely to, to sort of see the results uh, that you want to see. Yeah. I was just going to say to answer your question on like, how does advertising evolve from here? I think, you know, Roblox is working on a couple of things. One, they're going to do rewarded video ads, which I think will allow for more brands to be advertising on Roblox. Uh, second is, you know, hopefully they figure out what to do with immersive ads. Cause I do think, playable uh, ads have a lot of potential, but right now immersive ads funnel you to the branded experiences, which, you know, are sort of a dead end. And so if, if Roblox can figure out some way to use playable ads, but make it more engaging and make it better experience for the developer, for the player, for the brand, um, then, then I think there's a more opportunity with, with that feature as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely could take some time for them to figure this out. I mean, they really are pioneering a new type of advertising in a sense, which is really exciting. Uh, but it makes sense that it wouldn't be that that there's like a textbook on how exactly to roll this out very quickly out of the gate. But so it might take some time, but I, I'm pretty bullish on on where this could go. And one, one reason why I'm also bullish on where this could go, just from like a company standpoint, more so than even developers, is the... The worst part about Roblox's business is the take rate that platforms take uh, on it, right? Right. If you just you know pay thirty percent out of out of the gate to to Apple, for instance, um, that really limits what you can pay developers and what you keep as a as a platform owner. Uh, but with ads, 
um, especially if you can build like a pretty comprehensive ad network internally connected to your platform. Um, the margin possibilities on that are so much higher, which is great for Roblox as a business. It's great for potentially funneling more in, in the way to developers. Um, and yeah, hopefully it could even just kind of change how many people view Roblox as a business. Do you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, anytime Roblox makes money, developers make money. Now, you know, whether that the, the take rate is, is fair, I think is a more philosophical discussion. Um, but for sure, as long if, if Roblox can grow their revenue through ads, then that's definitely going to funnel to the developers as well. Okay, so uh, obviously advertising is a massive economic lever that Roblox is likely going to pull pretty heavily on over the next few years. But it's not the only economic feature or other other features that they're working on. They have a ton in their their roadmap that we can expect to roll out. Um, David, is there any you know maybe like two or three um, parts of the the roadmap, whether it's economic related or something else that you think will have an outsized impact on um, helping Roblox grow as a business, helping developers find much greater success. What are you excited about and looking at? Yeah, I think um, in-game commerce is really compelling. So I call it in-game commerce. They call it real world, real world co- commerce. I like in-game commerce because it's more describes what it is. Like uh, you're, you're going into an experience and then you have the opportunity to purchase a uh, item in the real world. And what that unlocks, I think, for brands is is a lot of potential. You know, you're able to track or track conversion rates for for players who come to an experience and then eventually buy something. And that's really valuable for for brands to be able to make the argument internally that their marketing dollars are are having a, a return. And then I think the other thing is, you know, if players can buy real world real world items, you've got um, you've got like you can turn a fifty cent purchase into a fifty dollar purchase, and that I think is really compelling as a as a concept. Now, training people to start shopping in Roblox versus Walmart.com or Amazon.com that's going to take a long time, but the opportunity I think is is quite large for Roblox to grow top line revenue in that way. Um, awesome, yeah, I totally agree with that as well. Um, we, we should probably start wrapping up our Roblox section because we still got UEFA and maybe some other stuff to get to here. Uh, obviously, I'm fine spending a lot of time on Roblox, so it's the it's the biggest of them all. Um, but um, in last year's Roblox Developer Conference, CEO David Bazuki he laid out ten five year predictions that are all a bit wacky, and he's done this before and had you know some success doing so. I just wanted to get your um, quick take on some of those. Is there any one or two that you think are most likely to play out or like any one or two that you would just absolutely bet against? I mean, I looked at the list, all of them seemed pretty like in Roblox's control to sort of determine how they were defined and whether they were achieved. So uh, the one that stood out to me was, was uh, number one, which was a Roblox developer will be valued at $1 billion. So I think this is the one that I sort of looked at and I was like, okay, that's a, that's a bold statement because uh, currently, you know, the top performing or the top monetizing experience makes around a hundred million dollars. And if we're looking five years out, you know, just on Roblox's current growth trajectory, they're probably only going to like slightly more than double in in size, right? So, you know, you'd be looking at a five x revenue at the current, uh, you know, four to five x revenue multiple. The biggest multiple I've seen to date was when um, Embracer Group purchased Bloxburg for $100 million when Bloxburg was making $30 million in revenue. Mm. And so, you know, a little bit more than a 3x multiple, which I thought, which I think everyone everyone in the industry thinks is a little bit high. Um, and so, you know, I think billion dollars is a bold statement, but if you layer on advertising and layer on real world, world commerce, that looks a lot more ch- achievable, right? Like if, if they can figure out advertising and double the the amount of revenue that every player in their player base brings uh, to the platform, then you start to look at that and say, okay, that looks 
possible. It's not guaranteed, but you know, one of these has to be a bold bet. And I think that's the one. Interesting. And just so, um, our listeners kind of know what these are <laughs> if they if they haven't seen them. Uh, I mean, the one that took the most headlines was saying Roblox will become a dating app, which I mean, OK, yeah. uh, but other things are like, you know, a Fortune 500 company will use it as part of the recruiting process. Uh, a school will integrate a full K-12 curriculum, um, including language classes, et cetera. Um, you know, a fashion designer will be like native to Roblox and become really big without, you know, having started in the physical apparel world or, or anything. Yeah. So like, I feel like all of these probably are already happening. Like if you think about how big Roblox is, like all of these are probably happening on, on some level. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Uh, but I think you're right that the $1 billion developer mark, that's definitely the sign that they will have unlocked something, you know, massively compelling as a business. Um, but okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, last question for you on Roblox before we move on. Roblox is currently a $24 billion business, whereas a business like Meta, the largest you know, social network in the world, um, is worth a trillion dollars. So Roblox is still, you know, just two and a half percent of the size of the largest social media company, if that's even a valid comparison. Um, but I'm just, you know, we'll kind of start We'll end here on a far out question, David, which is, you know, when all is said and done, looking at the long term of Roblox, um, how big do you think that they can potentially become? Is Are we talking meta level numbers? Are we talking way less than that? What do you think? I mean, I think they're doing all the same things that that meta does with Facebook and Instagram. So, uh, yeah, you know. I, I wrote a bunch of numbers down to like calculate why it could be, but you know, I just threw a bunch of numbers at you already. So I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to say, yes, it's possible. And uh, you know, I think that the interesting question is like, what type of acquisitions will Roblox make in the coming years in the same way, you know, Meta made a lot of acquisitions for to, to grow. Um, I'm curious what that would look like for Roblox as they, as they sort of scale over time. Yeah, that's a very good question. I don't know. They have made a ton of acquisitions, but not really of other major types yeah. of, of networks. So that would be that would be interesting to see. Okay, well, let's go ahead and switch gears to, to UEFN. The Unreal Editor for, not, for Fortnite has only been live for about a year at this point. So it still is very young, still in building mode in a lot of ways. But uh, David, what is the general consensus among creators about how this first year went? Um, and what are the biggest things that are being pointed out that need to be solved for UEFN to kind of take it up that next level? Yeah, I think first and foremost, it's a dream come true for for you know many or most creators on the platform. Before the big UEFN announcement in March, you know, creators were making a fifth if not less than what they're making today. So what that meant for a lot of these top creators is like they could quit their day jobs. They, you know, were doing Fortnite creative in their free time, uh, making a little bit of supplemental income, but they're mostly just doing their, their, you know, their traditional day jobs. So yeah, now, now they can become professional UEFN developers. And I think that that is such a gift. And, you know, the, the $250 million that, Epic is investing in this creator economy is extremely generous. So overwhelmingly, the sense is like, you know, thank you, Epic, for for everything that you've done for us. Um, I think uh, you know we can we can talk challenges. There's obviously you know the fact that it's a new tool set, the fact that you know Fortnite was not designed to be a UGC platform originally it has become one. And so you have to deal with all of the tech debt associated with not having done that from, from the outset. So it's going to take some time for Fortnite to, to introduce the types of tools that allow for the same types of experiences that you see on Roblox. And that's, you know, that's just been the biggest challenge so far is the fact that, you know, there hasn't been persistence. Uh, so you can't have progression in these games. And if you can't have progression, how do you retain players? Um, so, you know, over time, we're going to see more features get added. And I think the, t- the quality of the content will, will just go up from there. This is sort of a, an unfair question, or at least just very context dependent. But um, if, 
you had to, or a studio was talking to you, looking to build on a UGC platform, and they were, you know, trying to pick between Roblox or UEFN. How would you go about answering that question for them on on where to build or both? Yeah, so if you're going to build a game from scratch, then Fortnite is your place to go because you know the creator base is growing. I think when I first uh, reported on it in December, it was at like 12,500. Last time I checked, it's now at 17,500. So that's a big wow. leap in just a month. So I, I expect that to continue to grow. But even still, when you compare that to Roblox's 5.6 million developers, it's there's far more opportunity to you know make a quick buck in Fortnite than there is in Roblox. So if you're starting, if you're just going to build a new game, then then absolutely go for Fortnite. If you care more about like building a specific type of game or you want to adopt a game, uh, then I would go for Roblox because if you have a game that's already established in Roblox, it's a lot easier to maintain that. You have a lot more options for how you can, you know, retain players, engage a community. Right now on Fortnite, for example, there's no way to link out to a Discord page. So if a player comes into your game, there's no way to sort of lock them in or be able to communicate with them after they leave the game. So they're basically lost forever. And Roblox, on the other hand, you know, you can you can build a community by bring, bringing players into your game. And then when you have an update, you can ping them and say, hey, here's an update, come back to the game. So, you know, there's just a lot more options on Roblox. It's just, the problem is that's so, so darn competitive. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's fair. Um, do you think it generally makes sense for teams to build on both like i know there are a bunch of you know ugc studios that are trying to build on all of these different platforms do you think that generally is a wise move or should teams be specializing in in one of these platforms i think a lot of these studios who build on both are doing branded experiences Hmm. and uh you know that's that's a way to have you know, more guaranteed revenue, maybe a lifestyle business, but that isn't going to lead to, you know, becoming the next uh, Bloxburg, for example. So the developers who I've seen successful on Roblox have been building for many, many years. Uh, They're very familiar with what works. They're familiar with who, who they should be partnering with. It's just a lot easier to once you have success to keep it on Roblox versus Fortnite, it could be gone in a few weeks. Yeah. Well, I'm curious to get your take on what is actually working on UEFN so far. Um, and how, how does that compare to Roblox? Yeah. So like on UEFN, I, you know, I mentioned there's not a lot of options. On UEFN, you can, you know, have a very clickable thumbnail. Apparently the thumbnail is like the most important thing <laughs> to get players into your game, which yeah. is surprising on one level, but also if you think about it, it's like, you know, these players come to shoot guns and shoot each other. So, you know, theoretically you put them in any environment that they can do that in, you know, they're going to do it. And so the thumbnail ends up being sort of the, the differentiating factor. Uh, and that's, that's been representative of the Fortnite creative ecosystem to date, like you only see one or two non practice maps or, you know, shooter maps in the top 25. Anytime you look at it. And that's because the vast majority of players still play battle Royale and they use Fortnite creative as a way to warm up for their, their session or to practice. So I think, um, unfortunately on Fortnite, you know, if you want to have a breakout success, you're still locked into a very specific type of game and that doesn't allow for creators to differentiate differentiate themselves through gameplay, and it more ends up being about like, do they have the most clickable thumbnail? Yeah, hopefully that changes. I mean, it makes sense. You see kind of a meta like that on YouTube as well, where you know thumbnails kind of help drive uh, attention, but still at the end of the day, you have to retain people through your videos, get them to subscribe and such. And so maybe a similar dynamic will eventually <laughs> take place on UEFN. Although it's kind of weird to think about in a, in a game setting like that. Um, you also yeah. had, um, laid out some elements previously about what makes a successful Roblox game. How does that compare or contrast to UEFN, or is it still really just about the thumbnails these days? Yeah, well, until, I mean, so Fortnite just 
introduced uh, save point devices or, or persistent devices. So basically, now you can save a certain number of, of, uh, of um, player data types, I would call it. So that does allow for there to be a certain degree of progression. I haven't seen any games come out that are like super deep in terms of progression, but it's more around like being able to track what your like kill death ratio is over time and, and being able to do leaderboards and, and those types of things, which is obviously really important for the existing audience. So it's still yeah. a big win. Um, but hopefully over time we see uh, more, more diverse content. One, one of the things I've seen, which I think is quite compelling is, isometric dungeon crawlers that sort of similar to Diablo. Um, and, you know, that was enabled by a recent update where you have more options for, for camera angles. And so that I think is really compelling is like if, if players can play these other types of games and they can progress and collect, you know, loot, they can loot, they can come back more and want to do the next level once it's updated there's a lot more opportunity for, for building an audience over time. Uh, so I'm, I'm definitely bullish on, on the platform. It's just, it's going to take some time for those features to come online and, and then for players to sort of change their, their um, play patterns to be more towards all sorts of game genres versus just battle Royale extensions. Yeah. Uh, that makes sense as well. Um, and obviously one major difference between Roblox and Epic is that Epic is also making games and experiences, whereas Roblox is purely the the platform provider. And that's not necessarily new. They've been building the Unreal Engine forever. Fortnite has been a successful game for a long time, kind of alongside it. Uh, but even so, that, uh, you know, that way of working persists. Um, and with Epic, you know, some say that's a good thing because you learn a lot from being your own customer. And, you know, they recently launched, you know, the collaboration with Lego and a racing game and a music game that maybe, you know, grows the, the overall pie of who wants to play on Fortnite. But you also have some people that are critical in saying that it's a conflict of interest that, you know, they're creating experiences that take attention away from what other creators on the platform are making. Um, where do you fall on on this and see this playing out longer term? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, there's no Fortnite creative without Battle Royale. So I think there's, there's no world in which you can say that uh, Epic creating its own games is bad for for the, the creator economy and the creator ecosystem. There are some negative side effects, you know, mistrust. I think there probably are uh, creators or there will be creators who feel like their games tanked in metrics because uh, Fortnite came out with a experience that was basically making their uh, their game irrelevant or obsolete. So I think you'll see these examples where you know an existing game gets totally tanked because there's just a better version of it created by Epic. But at the end of the day, like when you look at it from a total ecosystem level, Epic is bringing in millions of players that eventually trickle into these uh, creative experiences. And there that is, you know, objectively good for for creators. Yeah. Uh, last question for you on on UEFN. Um, I mean, I asked you kind of the big wild question about Roblox. Can it be this big, massive thing um, in the future at another another tier of, of scale? Um, how do you think UEFN's scale potential compares to Roblox. Does it also have that same potential? Um, do you think it'll always be smaller than Roblox? How, how do you see the size of the big two, if you want to call them that, um, playing out over the long term? Yeah, I mean, one thing is like, there's not a lot of crossover between uh, b- between the Roblox and Fortnite ecosystems or even player bases. So, you know, I think that's compelling because it means that the whole UGC industry is, can grow, you know, simultaneously. There's not going to be as much cannibalization, um, at least for now. But, uh, you know, Fortnite just announced that they're going to be launching mobile up again in Europe. And I think that will be a really interesting experiment to see how many more players are coming into Fortnite now that they're accessing mobile because 78% of players on Roblox or mobile. So, you know, you do a little bit of math and you take, uh, let's say it's 70 million, uh, I'm trying to remember, 100 million MAU, like 
I think that was probably at the peak, but let's just say it's 100 million MAU. And you divide that by uh, by 0.3, then you're you know you're going to triple. You're going to more than triple that. So so basically, uh, you know that ends up being around 300 million MAU potentially, which is close to Roblox. So like if you if you if you are comfortable with those assumptions, you could say that Fortnite would be as big as Roblox if they had access to mobile, which they don't today. And as we see Europe come online, we'll start to get a better sense of of how many new players are coming in uh, to play Fortnite on mobile. Gotcha. Well, it'll be an exciting future to see where this all plays out. Obviously, Epic is still having regulatory battles, fighting <laughs> fighting against Apple um, to you know, change fees to change the way games are accessed, third party storefronts, etc. So um, it wouldn't be surprising to just see the the foundation of like how these companies potentially reach certain users around the world to to change over time as as these rules change as new platforms grow, etc. Um, but let's go ahead and kind of switch gears to our last segment, which is just really quickly to hit on um, other platforms. And obviously, what we in gaming kind of consider UGC gaming is dominated by these big two, Roblox and UEFN. Um, but there are others out there kind of in their own niches. Is Are there any others that you think the industry is sleeping on? Like, who who else should we be paying more attention to? Yeah, well, I mean, you can't forget about Minecraft. Uh, if I was going to say big two, I would call it big three. The, okay. the the challenge with Minecraft is that it's owned by Microsoft, which is under scrutiny from regulators, and so they're going to be very conservative about moderation and and what they do with the the UGC ecosystem. So I, I wrote an article like a year ago, just basically not super, somewhat bearish on on Minecraft as a result of that, but there's still a massive user base there. I think. Um, Phil Spencer reported last year that there was 120 million uh, monthly active users on Minecraft still. And a lot of those are playing single player uh, experiences, but the UGC economy is still a, a large chunk of the overall market. Um, not as big as Fortnite or, or Roblox, but you know, not too far behind in terms of uh, uh, payouts to developers. So you know, I don't know what their strategy is, but it will be interesting to see if they are able to sort of reinvigorate that creator ecosystem. Because so far, you know, you don't see a lot of updates from them. Um, and that could just be, you know, a function of, of them wanting to keep their strategy to themselves. But, you know, it's easy to forget about them because there's not a lot of, of new news coming out of that that ecosystem. That's true. Um I think on the on the you know leaving the UGC games platform side and just looking at sort of modding, uh, there's you know a couple big ones GTA, The Sims that are both coming out with new games in the next couple of years. It'll be super interesting to see how they evolve their their large uh, UGC ecosystems. I'm hopeful that they will take steps to make it a little bit more accessible for for you know new creators to to get involved because right now. You know, you have to do all sorts of of, uh, of manual sort of hacks in order to to be able to create your own content in in these platforms. So that's what I would say is like those are two really large franchises that have an audience ready to consume UGC, and that's really important for for getting a healthy UGC ecosystem going. So I, I personally am bullish on any franchise that has a large audience that um, is is thinking about UGC. Mm-hmm. Do you think that'll become more the norm? These large franchises unlocking UGC components in in bigger ways. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think that's where the majority of growth for the creator economy is going to come from in the next ten years. Is franchises starting to adopt these features? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and another example that I wrote about in Novic Digest maybe a couple months ago, but you reinforced in the State of UGC report. Um, was kind of what we're seeing with Studio Wildcard and Ark Survival Ascended, which they're you know they're um, 
their their modding capabilities are basically being powered through through Overwolf. But what's interesting is it's not just users building mods and you know this dinosaur survival you know, game, um, but there are you know other game studios basically building what are like larger mods or DLCs um, on top of another studio's game. Um, and this is really like the only example still that I can think of where this is happening, although it's like a really intriguing idea. I just wanted to get your pulse on um, how how realistic is it that we see this type of scenario existing more in the future? It's somewhat adjacent to UGC, but um, kind of it's still in that realm of just people building on top of everyone else's um, games. I think I'm going to turn this one around on you because I feel like you want to answer this this question. Uh, I, I have not I have not uh, taken a deep dive into Ark Survival, uh, so I uh, I am less familiar with it. But I will say this: look, I like the the Roblox generation has, is you know going to continue to age up, right? And they grew up with sort of uh, an expectation of being able to create and engage with the content. Uh, that is in front of them. And I think that's just going to become table stakes for developers across the world is, is be- being able to, to, um, to unlock creativity of their, of their audience and allowing them to engage in the content on a deeper level and, and, and customize their experience. Yeah. And I mean, you mentioned turning it around at me. I honestly have no idea <laughs> where that's going to go. I mean, I, I generally <laughs> think that, you know, as barriers to creation fall, Um, and you know, as we create tools for others to build on top of a wide range of other experiences, if the opportunity is big enough, um, then, you know, in the same way that we've seen more professional studios, you know, build on Roblox, which wasn't really meant for that initially, but it's, it's happening anyways, because that's where all the people and all the money is that, um, similarly, sure. If the audience is large enough, the economics are compelling enough. I think you could see more organized businesses kind of come in all sorts of new directions to try building on on other people's platforms or other people's games. I'm not really sure where that goes, but it's it's an interesting interesting new world <laughs> that we could be entering. I mean, I definitely think we're we're entering that world. Actually, I saw um uh Century Games is a fairly well established uh mobile game company. They uh, they um, produced White Whiteout Survival, which I think hit like four hundred million dollars yeah. in revenue in its first few weeks. They have a they have Liveopia on on Roblox, um, mm. and they I think that launched in twenty twenty. So they're a mobile native developer who came to Roblox to to develop a game, and then just a few weeks ago, actually maybe last week, they announced that they're creating a mobile game for Liveopia. So. Oh. Yeah, that's going to be a really interesting thing to track is, you know, can these developers, whether they be AAA or mobile developers, can they come to platforms that are they're not native to, uh, build either new IP or leverage existing IP to grow the audience and then monetize that audience on, you know, in more traditional, more highly monetizable platforms. I think they totally can. I mean, as you mentioned earlier in the episode, we're all, it's already happening, right? You mentioned Zekers with uh, Lethal Company, I think. Yeah. Um, and so I think we're going to see so much more of that. Um, and I, one thing that I've kind of talked about off and on briefly on the, the podcast is I'm just really curious what this generation of entrepreneurs will, will do in the games industry. Obviously, making games is one piece, but if, if your worldview of what gaming can and, and will be is coming from a completely different perspective, like how does that also change your view on like what other tools should be made or what other innovations and in distribution, you know, are, are possible or like how else can we think about building on top of all of these experiences in ways that just haven't really been thought through yet. So I'm just really curious to see what this generation of entrepreneurs will do. And I think we're just starting to see, um, you know, the beginnings of it through the the lethal companies of the world and obviously the successes on on Roblox um, as well. Um, oh, one question I did want to ask was just sort of about AI. Obviously, it's like the craziest buzzword of late, but it is interesting in a, a UGC setting because it further enables the barriers uh, to creation to be lowered, which is the foundational purpose of UGC gaming. And so 
Um, I, I just wanted to ask, like, where in the UGC gaming world do you think AI could actually have the most impact in unlocking something big and new for the industry? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a great use case for for UGC because most you know most players don't have technical skills, so being able to just write a prompt and, and see something populate and, and then hopefully you know being able to manipulate that in ways to refine it, you know, with dragging drop tools, I think is a really clean use case that could unlock a lot of new content and a lot more creativity from those who are less technically inclined. Um, and where, where do I see that happening? I mean, Roblox is working on AI tools right now. I think they've got a treasure trove of, of, um, of training data off of 5.6 million developers. So essentially like anything you could possibly imagine is probably in that AI. And, and so, It'll be really interesting to see what is able to be created off of the back of that. Uh, I've seen some early early demos of it. It looks pretty pretty compelling. And I mean, when you combine ChatGPT with Roblox, you can actually create like pretty uh, robust experiences without knowing how to code, just copying whatever ChatGPT says. So I think if you see that happening in Roblox, it will it will unlock a, a ton of creativity. I think my concern is just like what that means for the the developers who have, you know, put in the hard work to to learn these these technical skills and and whether those will be uh, as valued as they are today once AI enables people to just put in a prompt and and get the output. Yeah, I, I mean, my guess is it'll probably turn out to look a bit more like mobile in the sense that. Um, a lot of what differentiates the winners and losers is their ad budgets. And you mentioned earlier how Roblox so far is pretty meritocratic and how they handle the algorithm. Um, but it really wouldn't surprise me one day uh, if they they look to at least have a separate, you know, more like sponsored games or you know sponsored experiences you know, similar to what you see on, on Amazon even, uh, or the app store. So well, they do have sponsored experiences. Um, it's just right. that there's sort of a cap on, on how effective that, the, that advertising lever is. Um, but, but yeah, I think, you know, before that can happen, there needs to be higher monetization potential in order for, for, um, developers to really lean on marketing, uh, more heavily like you see in mobile games. Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, but especially for those who have had that success and already have it and maintaining it and kind of keeping their lead like a Candy Crush has you know, maintained its dominance for, for so long. Um, I don't know. Maybe we'll see history rhyme a little bit there. Um, last question for you on, on UGC Games, David. Um, you, you see a bunch of small teams here that most people in the industry probably are not paying attention to. Um, could you maybe just, you know, give a couple shout outs to a couple of talented teams you think are working on cool things that you think could pop off in the future or just that you're excited about? Yeah, I mean, so one thing to, to note about the Roblox ecosystem is it really is all about uh, who you know. And so you know, if you want to, if you want to know about the the like top developers, you should probably reach out to Novik for for some consulting. Um, there are a couple that I will shout out because they're talented, and uh, I have a lot of respect, and and they've you know helped me learn about the platform. So uh, Simple Games is a, a developer who you know, hasn't had any like massive, massive hits, but consistently produces games that do well and um, get a really good return. So right now he has a survival game out. Um, uh, So the CEO is is, um, Nathan Clemens and uh, he has a survival game out that has around 8,000 concurrence. And, you know, uh, that's really good for the platform. And uh, he's super knowledgeable, thinks about things in a in a really sound way, and he was sort of a key contributor to me thinking through Roblox developer Unity Economics. So, if you want to learn more about the platform, he's super friendly, very busy, so he may not be available, but um, definitely a good person to to chat with. Um, and then, obviously, I have to give a shout out to my team at Super Social. 
really talented developers over there. If I could uh, invest in individuals, I would definitely invest in a few of the devs on that team. So um, yeah, that's what that's what I'll say as far as uh, as far as you know, good devs to know. No, that's great. Um, uh, thanks for for sharing those. Well, we can go ahead and wrap up. I think really the last thing I want to say is that if you enjoyed this conversation, you enjoy our content on UGC more broadly, and you're either building in the space or are eyeing it. In some way, you know, as an investor or a big studio or a brand or or whoever you are, please reach out. Um, you know, we at Novic, with David in particular, um, would be thrilled to chat and see how we can help. We work with a bunch of studios, brands, um, teams in and around the industry um, all the time, and would love to see if we can help you out in this this crazy new world of of UGC gaming. Um, I'll, I'll leave a link for reaching out to us in the show notes. Uh, but also, I mean, I recommend too just paying attention to our content. I'm I'm guessing if you're listening to this episode, most of you are probably signed up to Novic Digest. But if you're not, you know, you're missing out on a lot of great content that that David is writing. He even published a piece. Uh, I guess it'll be like a week ago when when this um, when this episode comes out. Um, but definitely make sure to to sign up and and see that. But also, David, um, I know you're sharing insights. Um, um, elsewhere too. Uh, for those who are listening that want to get the the maximum insight uh, out of you, where should they be paying attention? Yeah, LinkedIn appears to be my jam these days. I would, I given my generic name, I would look for David Taylor Novick uh, to find me because you'll probably see there are millions of David Taylors out there in the world doing really <laughs> important work. <laughs> Yeah, your LinkedIn game is very strong. Definitely recommend um, checking David out on LinkedIn. Um, well, awesome. This has been a lot of fun, David. So thank you for hopping on. And I look forward to continuing to learn from you and the months and years ahead. Thanks for having me, Aaron. If you enjoyed today's episode, whether on YouTube or your favorite podcast app, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, or give a five-star review. And if you want to reach out or provide feedback, shoot us a note at podcast at novic.co or find us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Plus, if you want to learn more about what Novic has to offer, make sure to check out our website, www.novic.co. There, you can sign up for the number one games industry newsletter, Novic Digest, or contact us to learn about our wide-ranging consulting and advisory services. Again, that is www.novic.co. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode.